morning. It's good to see each of you here this morning. We have visitors with us. You honor us by choosing to worship God with us. We hope that you want to be back. That's your first opportunity. If you weren't here last Sunday, we spent some time looking at our memory verse and how we were told to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And we spent some time looking at transformation. And I sort of gave a three-step approach to transformation based upon Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And basically it was to find a new pattern. And that pattern, of course, is Christ Jesus. And to find a new mind that was the mind of Christ pursuing the mind of Christ to think like Jesus. We talked about the principle we had some time ago. It was very popular. What would Jesus do? Putting our mind sort of in the mind of Jesus, the mind of submission to God, seeking to do his will in all things. And then we sort of got down to the third point, find God's will for you. And I really do believe if you begin patterning your life after Christ, you begin pursuing the mind of Christ, that God's will becomes ever present for you. But this is third point this morning that I really want us to spend some time on. If you were clearly told that this is something that God wants you to do, that God really wants you to do. In fact, God expects you to do this. Would you want to do it? Yes or no? Yes, it's okay. I'm going to tell you one thing that you could start right now, this morning, and begin practicing every day because this is something that God wants you to do. Would you be inclined to do it? Hopefully so. Hopefully so. Okay, now, Mark, if you just give me one thing, let me start with that and let me begin doing that. And that is my ambitious goal this morning is to tell you there is one thing that God wants you to do every day of your life. This one thing that God says, I expect you to do this. You ready? You can know God's will in this one area. There's your memory verse. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. That's pretty clear, isn't it? So what is God's will for you is to give thanks in all circumstances. Now, not everyone gets this secret. And I think that even sitting here this morning, that some of us may be more dispositionally leaning toward giving God thanks. And for other people, it's going to become a spiritual discipline for you. It's going to be something you're going to have to begin working on from day one. Some people... They just thank God for everything. I mean, it, it, you know, that, that they see a beautiful day. It's thank you, Lord. You know, and someone else looks like, well, it's awful hot today. Or, you know, it's not going to rain or it's going to rain. I mean, not everyone gets this. Luke tells a story about one person who did get it. In fact, it's found in Luke chapter 17. Now, it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off and they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Now, leprosy is a skin disease. We, in our culture, we don't get to see it firsthand very often. It still does occur in the world. It's a very infectious skin disease that they could pass from one person to another. And it was from the biblical days that people who had leprosy were removed from the community. They were removed from the camp because it was so contagious. Now, it, it begins just as sort of some skin eruptions, but as it progresses, you begin losing the digits off your, you know, like your toes begin to fall off, your fingers begin to fall off, you sort of lose your tissue from the outside in, and there's different forms of leprosy, but that was one of the most disfiguring things. And so you could very often see someone who was a leper because they were missing fingers and toes and nose and ears and things like that. It was just a horrible, horrible disease. And so these men saw Jesus. They knew of him. Remember that Jesus had already been to Samaria once before. Remember the woman at the well. So they knew of him. And they began crying out to him, have mercy on us. So that meant if you were a leper, that you had to leave your family. You had to leave your community. You had to leave. You couldn't be part of the main culture. And so they sort of flocked together. And very often they lived upon just the kindness of people sort of sliding food their way or whatever. Because no one really wanted to come in contact with a leper. And so shouting, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. And so here we have Jesus who saw them. He said to them, according to the law, go show yourself to the priest. Now that was one of the persons that could claim your leprosy free. The priest could look at your skin and give you more or less a blessing that your leprosy is cured or your leprosy is resolved. And so they went and they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice, glorified God. He's praising God. I'm healed. I'm healed. Look, I'm healed. 
And he fell down on his face at his, that is Jesus' feet, giving him what church? Thanks. And he was a Samaritan. The Samaritans weren't considered to be that great a Jew. They were sort of a subset of the Jews. And they didn't think too highly of them. But Luke says, now this guy who came, he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? This person who's not in the mainstream Jews? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Ten people healed of a horrible, disfiguring illness. And only one of them came back to thank the Lord. Now, I'm not great with math, but I believe that's 10%, right? 10% had an attitude of gratitude. One-tenth. Who do you think received the most healing from their experience? The nine who just got healed? Or the one who was healed and grateful. Jesus says, you're now well. He had the right attitude. He was thankful to the Lord for what he had done. And this man had a much different perspective view. And I think he was twice blessed. Not just because of what the Lord had done, but because of his appreciation for what the Lord had done. His gratitude made the difference. So... When we look at our memory verse, that it says that we are to give thanks to God in every circumstances because this is God's will for us. We need to understand that somehow that gratitude in itself must have a transforming aspect to it. Would God ask you to do anything that wasn't good for you? No. It's transformational to have an attitude of gratitude. To be thankful to God every day of your life. To have that mindset. There's two bookends I need for you to understand this morning. One's Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. To understand how God thinks about us. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. God says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. So if you're sitting there this morning and you're struggling with something in your life and you just wonder, does God even care? Does God even mindful of what I'm going through? I'm going to tell you, yes, he does. Because Jeremiah chapter 29 says, hey, God has good thoughts for you. He has an ideal of a future for you. He has an ideal of peace for you. He has an ideal of hope for you. And that's God's feeling toward you. So that's one book in you need to put in your life. And all the other chapters in your life, you can put between that and the next one. But this first bookend, you know, bookends, hold two books up, a set of books up. This one book in your life, you need to know that God thinks well of you. He wants to give you a future. He wants to give you peace. And he wants to give you hope. Now, how many would like that? Future, peace, and hope with God. Oh, everybody wants that. Everybody wants that. Nobody would say, I got plenty of that. No, you want that. Okay, that's one. Here's the second one, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and called according to his purpose. That's the other book in. On this one perspective, you need to know that God's thoughts for me are for a future, for hope, and for peace, okay? Then all the other chapters, all the other circumstances, all the other things you're going on in your life, you can go ahead and think about all those if you want to, but you need to think about the other book in. That somehow from there to here, everything that happens that God can work out for good for those who love the Lord and call according to his purpose. You need to let that be the bookends of your life. That whatever happens from that point to this point, know that God has a plan for you. God has a hope for you. God has a peace for you. And God's going to make all things work together for good. But there are some pretty scary chapters in life, aren't there? Some pretty scary things to happen. So how do I get from this bookend to that bookend? It's our memory verse. And everything give thanks to God. For this is his will for you.
in Christ Jesus. So we have to develop this. And for nine of those people, it wasn't on their radar. But for one, 10%, it was easy. And maybe this morning, maybe there's 10% of you who are doing this already. And you're saying, amen, Mark, amen, preach your brother. And for me, some of you may think, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm not as thankful as I ought to be. Or, or maybe I don't like where my life is at right now. Or, or, or maybe I don't know that God does love me. That God does have a plan for my peace and hope. Or I don't see how this is going to work out for good. But I firmly believe if you make those the bookend of your life, those two verses... And the middle part is the memory verse today. You can become a grateful person. I guess you might say, why is it so important for me to have this gratitude? Why is it so important for me just to take the simplest blessings of life, of air to breathe and, and food and health? And why is it so important for me to focus in on gratitude? I mean, what's the purpose of that? I mean, really, you know, I'm thankful But why should I have to every day just sort of enumerate the things I'm thankful for every day? Why do I have to do that? Well, if God's saying so is not enough, I'm going to give you some science this morning, okay? One of the things I try to do is, as a Christian educator and counselor and minister, and, you know, I try to integrate everything. And it's amazing how much science integrates with faith. They're not contradictory to each other. Very often, science reveals what faith's already said exists. But there's a researcher out in California, Robert Emmons, and he spent now over eight years looking at the scientific evidence of the benefit of a person having gratitude in their life. And so he actually has developed some pretty neat ways of researching it. He would assign people to groups, and they'd have one group with him and do an attitude a gratitude exercise, another group just do some other general exercise, and then measure the outcomes and see what's happening. And he's replicated many different stories to find that gratitude actually has a scientific foundation for what it does to people. And when you begin looking at the research, it's somewhat astounding. Just the idea of thankfulness in self having a transforming property. He found that people who have this gift of gratitude experiences all kinds of advantages in life. And he really does believe that some people are dispositionally more grateful than others, but you can teach people to be grateful. And when you teach people to be grateful, they have positive changes. But it's like that 10% that we saw with the leper. Some people are just good at it. And some people are not. Now, I like listening to young people pray because they pray different than old people. You ever seen a child say grace over a meal and sometimes they'll think i thank you lord for the meat and i thank you lord for potatoes you know i can't remember was it john lewis or one of them said said i don't like peas <laughs> you know <laughs> he sort of excluded that i think they remember i don't like peas it's one of, the, one of the grandkids said that but to hear them just 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 it comes out of them and sometimes we wonder why kids are happier than adults Maybe they're dispositionally more thankful than we are. Maybe they don't take so many things for granted. Maybe they have this attitude of gratitude. And so we see there's multiple advantages. And as we begin looking at some of the things, gratitude improves emotional and physical health. Did you hear the second one? Physical health. If you're poorly and puny, thank God. Be grateful for what you have. If you can get up in the morning and it still hurts, be thankful you can get up. Because some people can't. Be thankful for pain. Pain tells you there's something wrong. You know, we think about what it would be like not to have pain. You know, it's really quite a curse. There are some people born neurologically where they cannot feel pain. And they have a shorter life expectancy than the average person. Because they don't know to go to the doctor because their appendix is going to burst. Or that they've got a broken bone and they burn themselves. But being grateful can improve emotional, physical health, strengthens relationships. If you're not getting along with somebody at home, maybe you need to start talking to God about some things. Being grateful. Some strategies include keeping a gratitude journal. We're going to talk about some things, learning prayers of gratitude and visual reminders. Now, this is not necessarily from a Christian perspective. This is a scientific researcher looking at 
the benefits of gratitude. Now, in science, when we try to practice research, we believe something called the null hypothesis. There's no relationship between these two variables. We assume there's no relationship to it. That way we won't be wrong. We don't find anything. It's sort of a way of science that sort of strokes or ego. There is no relationship between these two variables. We're going to research it in any ways. But when we find a relationship, we talk about the strength of relationship. And the research on gratitude says there's extremely positive strength of relationship between the presence of gratitude and psychological, mental, emotional, and social health. So if you don't like where you're at psychologically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, get grateful. Find gratitude. Quote from Dr. Eamons. Without gratitude, life can be lonely, depressing, and impoverished. Gratitude enriches human life. It elevates, energized, inspires, and transformed. People are moved, open, and humbled through the expression of gratitude. So if you feel like your get up and go has gone up and went, let me feel that way. Your get up and goes and got up and went. Feel that way? What do you need to do? Get grateful. Be mindful. When someone asks how you are, don't give a litany of what's wrong. Well, let me tell you. Sit down. It's going to take a while. Start saying what's right. Start focusing in on it. And I mean, I really do believe, I found that when people ask me how I am and I say I'm blessed, they go, whoa. They're not used to hearing that. They're used to hearing fine or okay or the, or the litany of lists of things that's wrong from people. But it keeps putting it over and over again that God's command to do this is to our benefit. If you want a rich, fulfilling life, you got to do what, do God's will. This is God's will in one area that you can begin practicing. Here's some experimental comparisons. Those who kept gratitude journals on a weekly basis, exercised more regularly, reported fewer physical symptoms, felt better about their lives in the whole, were more optimistic about the upcoming week compared to those who recorded hassles or neutral events in life. So they had a a randomized controlled experiment. They assigned one group, okay, y'all are going to keep a thankful journal, a gratitude journal, okay? And y'all are just going to, keep a journal about what's going on, the hassles and stuff like that. And y'all just write whatever you want to do. So I had three different groups. One wrote about gratitude. One wrote about their junk going on in their life, the hassles. And one just wrote about whatever they want to write about. They can write about, you know, daisies or whatever. I don't know, whatever they want to write about. They compared the three groups and they found the group who wrote about gratitude had better health, fewer physical aches and pains, symptoms, and their lives at home would just seem better. By simply writing down things they were grateful for, keeping a gratitude journal every day of their life, at least on a weekly basis, writing down what they're thankful for. There's a measured difference between the three groups. So what does God say to be thankful? It is good for you. A related benefit was earned in the realm of personal goal obtainment. Now, I hate to mention this, but schools can start back. How many of you would like to have an awesome year academically in school? Do really well. They discovered in their research that students who had gratitude had higher grades. There was actually a difference between their academic achievement. Now, they were using college students, but I'm sure it applied to anyone. Had actually academic achievement higher than those who didn't have gratitude. Interpersonal and health based upon a two-month period compared to other experimental conditions. Just by keeping a list of things they were grateful for. A daily gratitude intervention, it can be self-guided exercises, just mentally focusing on things to be grateful for with young adults, resulted in high reports of positive states of alertness, enthusiasm, determination, attentiveness, and energy. Again, if you get up and gone, it's gone up and wet, you're not thankful enough. Be more thankful. Begin to have the attitude of gratitude. Participants in daily gratitude condition were more likely to report having helped someone with a personal problem or having offered emotional support to another relative to the hassles or social comparison condition. So those people who just were making a list of things that they were frustrated with, the, the, the problems of the day, the people who kept the problem inventory versus those who kept the gratitude inventory, the people who had a gratitude inventory were a lot more willing to help other people. Their eyes were open to the needs of other people. By having an attitude of gratitude versus an attitude of negativity and focusing on the hassles of life. 
the pro-social aspect of gratitude. Now, the research has been done not only in healthy populations, but also people who were diseased and had illnesses. They had people with adults with a neuromuscular disease, and, and I don't know what all qualified for that. I don't know if it was like MS or whatever, but they had to have some kind of neuromuscular disease. And they did a 21-day gratitude intervention. And at the end of that stay, the 21 days, the test period, they discovered that the people who did the gratitude intervention had higher energy, positive moods, a greater sense of feeling connected to others, more optimistic ratings of one's life, and better sleep duration and sleep quality relative to the control group. So before taking that Ambien, make a list of things you're grateful for. Why does God command us to do this? It's good for us. It is his will for us. So there's definite science behind it. When you look at all the different studies that are coming out, the Emons and others, what we're saying, there's a dose-specific relationship between gratitude and physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. What do I mean by dose-specific relationship? If you have a headache and you take two aspirins and the headache goes away, there's a dose-specific relationship between aspirin and the alleviation of pain. So what does it mean? You're probably going to take aspirin again when you have a headache in the future. So when I'm saying that when you practice gratitude, there's a dose-specific relationship between that and all this list of things that you have. More energy, better sleep, more positive outlook on life, better grades, better interpersonal relationships, less pain. All these things can benefit from having an attitude of gratitude. And this is not just with healthy individuals, as we saw. It's also people who had some pretty serious things going on in their life physically. It made all the difference. Oncologists have discovered it's not so much the diagnosis of cancer that determines whether or not someone's going to survive. It's a person's attitude. It's a person's attitude. And so why does God prescribe for us? The great physicians say, okay, you go to the doctor and they take out a prescription. I guess they still do that. They take out a prescription pad and they write in that illegible handwriting. Take something, BID twice a day or QID four times a day or QD once daily or whatever. They scribble all that stuff out. And you take the pharmacist and they give you this. God takes out his prescription pad and says, okay, here's what I prescribe. Daily gratitude. QD. Gratitude. QD. Every day. And for some of us, as I said, dispositionally, this lesson means nothing to you because you're doing it already. But for the 90% of the rest of us, it's a directive. If we say the way to transform yourself, not after this world, but after the image of Christ, is to have the mind of Christ, find a new pattern, and learn God's will. And it's real clear here, God has a will for us specifically in this area. What's the memory verse, church? So you're going to leave here today understanding God's will for you in this one area of your life with clarity, hopefully. And why does he do this? To give you a future, a peace, and a hope. And to let you know that all things work together for good if you really love it. And you're called according to his purpose. And all the events between here and there, you're like, three ways to do it. You can come up more. Say it. Pray, Lord, I'm thankful. Witness it. Tell other people, what are you thankful for? See what good the Lord has done in my life. Say it. Two, write it. Journal, list, whatever it takes. Put it before you. Practice it. Mental exercises. Think of things you're grateful for. I even read where one person put a rock in his pocket. So every time he reached to get change out, he saw this rock in his pocket and the rock in his pocket was reminded to be grateful. So before he put his change back up, he'd have to think of, think of something to say, I'm grateful for. And maybe grateful I've got change to buy a soft drink. But something he had to be thankful for before he put his change back in his pocket. Every time he saw the rock was a reminder of something, I have to think of something to be thankful for. He had a rock around his pocket. But 
If you're not dispositionally a person who's that way, then maybe you need to begin doing exercises. Maybe you need to be doing lists. Maybe you need to be doing things to remind you to be grateful. Because why, church? This is God's will for you. Brother John Nichols has been doing a great job. And he's been preaching on the Lord's Prayer. And when Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, thy will being done is made in what God says, right? And what does God say about my attitude of gratitude? To be thankful. To practice it. To disposition, let it have its effect in my life. I'm going to bring the lesson to a close with one thought. And it's a pretty sobering thought. Okay? And then Brother Ronnie's going to lead us an invitation song. And if you're subject to respond today, we'd love to assist you in any way. What if I woke up tomorrow? What if I woke up tomorrow with only what I was grateful for today? What if when you woke up tomorrow, you only had left in this world with what you're grateful for today? When I read that, I thought, oh my, I'm so ashamed. Because there are so many things I thought, well, I would not have this or I, I wouldn't have that or I wouldn't have this feeling or that. That was sobering to me. On how many areas of my life I may not be as conscious of the gratitude I need to have, which is God's will for me to be thankful for in all circumstances, no matter what's going on, to be thankful for it. Is that sobering to anyone else? If I woke up tomorrow with only what I would thank God for today, what would tomorrow look like for me? That's sobering. And I'm not saying that's how God works. But I'm saying that Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And I think abundant living is about doing God's will. And doing God's will is about doing, being mindful of the very simple things that God has blessed us with. One of the things that Eamon's found out in his research, which was sort of contradictory to what people thought, that the belief was that people who focused in on blessings and gratitude were more materialistic than people who weren't. But he discovered the more mindful people were gratitude, the less materialistic they were. That they found value in other things, not material things. Or they just looked at it as being a lot less important than some of the other things they were thankful for. So what do we say this morning? What's the one thing that God wants you to do, church? Be thankful. It's his will for you. So, did I measure up and do what I said I was going to do? Teach you one thing you can do right now, from this point forward, that could change everything. If you're here this morning, we would be thankful, if you are not a Christian, for you to respond to God's invitation, to confess Jesus, or say we buried with him in baptism, or if we can assist you anyway, Brother Ronnie's going to lead us in the song at this time.